So, Alan, I watched a movie a little while ago. Have you ever seen uh, the movie where Ryan Reynolds spends the entire time in a coffin? Yep. Uh, t- uh, two guys, a girl, and a luxury dreamliner. I don't... <laughs> dreamliner? That sound... Is that, that the... the name of a coffin? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the name of an airplane, Alan. Oh, well. The Boeing people are going to be very unhappy about The this. Boeing people, 737 Max, Dreamliner, it's all the same. <laughs> it's all the same to them. So, anyway, there was this movie, and I've got an idea. I've got a twist on it. Okay. And I think this could work. So Let me hear it. It's going to be the start of my big Hollywood career. So, I was thinking a gender-flipped version of that movie. Okay. So, this time you have, you have a lady actor. Uh, who is in a coffin, and the twist is, instead of being buried under the ground, uh-huh. this one's in the water. Yeah, d- okay. Do you want to know what I call it, Alan? Uh, do I want to know what you call it, Rob? Muriel at Sea. So what do you think? You, uh, I'm open to feedback. Are, are you open to feedback, Rob? <laughs> I'm open to gentle feedback. How fucking wide open are you to I have feedback, a, a Rob? a small window of feedback that I'm willing to take, but first things first, title stays. I don't feel like you're ready for feedback, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I am walking off this project immediately. Well, we've already brought on another coffin. <laughs> it's time. Time for a thrilling story of romance. Adventure, mystery, anything with an expired copyright. It's time for another Interrupted Tale. You know when a line sounds good where you're like, hey, I think I've really nailed it. Yeah. And then you're like, wait wait a minute now. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense the at all. The is not the... The person that invents the screenplay and then tries to get it sold as a major Hollywood movie. I don't know. Picture. That that coffin is a mover and a shaker. That thing is a kingmaker in this town. <laughs> don't cross that coffin. Oh, you never work here again. Hello and welcome to the show that usually ends another episode of Interrupted Tales. The podcast where my friend and I take turns reading stories to you, the listener, while the other person constantly interrupts. As always, I am Rob, and I'm joined tonight by the rocket to my pocket, Alan. How are you, Alan? I'm doing great, Rob. It's a, it's a new year. It's a, it's a new decade. It's a new score. It's, a it's new what sc- I'm trying to make happen in 2020. <laughs> a new score to what? <laughs> it's the new score. It's a new score of years rob it's, oh and then let me tell you this score is the <laughs> hottest score of all yeah if this score was at spring break it'd be called the score score because it always be scoring yes what better way to characterize the 20 year period <laughs> than by how hot it would be on spring break <laughs> well We've got a hot, spicy tale of uh, Latin survival today, Alan. Yeah, from the June 29th, 1921 Mm. edition of Pluck and Luck magazine. (laughs) Oh, the old (laughs) Pluck and Luck. Oh, remember those days, Rob? We used to go to the old Pluck and Luck after a hard day's work and pluck chickens for our second job. (laughs) Feel lucky that we could pay our rent. Nothing but pluck and luck. Well, the story has an even cheerier title, The White Death. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, about, it's by Paul Braddon, right. about whom we know nothing. Well, that's probably because we didn't attempt to know anything about Paul Braddon, but... He's a mystery. And now it's time to settle in for a nice restful siesta while we read you this week's tale. The ranch of Senor Diaz was on a charming slope overlooking the broad waters of one of the tributaries of the Parana, on whose opposite shore the rank grass grew 10 and 12 feet high. Oh, 10 and 12 feet high, right across the river, 
from the Willie Nelson Ranch. I know what you mean there. Rank grass as far as the eye can see and tote. The house itself had a tropical character. It was Spanish American, with cool, shady with cool, shady veranda, a long, low front, painted walls and latticed windows, a spacious court, and a flat roof, provided with a parapet, which gave the structure the semblance of a fort. Also the decorative cannons that also <laughs> set off the whole fort vibe. I thought the trebuchet was a bit much, to be honest. L- listen, Rob, you... You never know what they're going to have at the big lots. And if you don't get it right away, it's going to be gone by the next week. So you got to act fast. What I hate about it is you have to build your own cannons at the big lots. I know. It's really, it's it's like, you can't really save them that much money. (laughs) Many acres of cultivated land showed lines of sugar cane and tall trees laden with bananas. In surprising contrast to the dark, impenetrable mass of wild bushland which surrounded the settlement in the farther distance. Senora Diaz was one of the tropical beauties of whom Mario dreamed. And speaking of an impenetrable mass of wild bush, (laughs) a subject which you mentioned in the previous sentence, I would like to offer a correction and point out that bananas are actually grown on herbaceous flowering plants and not trees. Thank you. (laughs) Just wanted to correct something you said in the previous sentence to this one. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you. I, I would hate for anybody to uh, be misled by the wild bush. A lot of people over the years have been misled <laughs> by the wild bush, Rob. I, I have followed many a wild bush down the wrong path as a young man. I understand. I don't think you know how bushes work if you follow them down the path. <laughs> That was the problem. (laughs) I am going to test your gallantry, she said. With the handkerchief picking up competition. (laughs) What what does that look like exactly? It's a bit like a limbo contest, okay? (laughs) We take the handkerchief Uh uh and then we throw it down and you see how far you can bend. And we play calypso music (laughs) and it's, it's, it's a fun time. Can you do it on roller skates? Can't you do it on the roller skates is the question. Coming out of the veranda where I sat, by asking you to help me water my flowers, for with my lame hand, it is not easy for me to lift the heavy watering pot. Yeah, no, and uh, with my lame gallantry, it isn't easy for me to give a rat's ass. (laughs) By, uh, By which I mean, of course, dear madam, allow me to water thine petunias and stamp out the perfidious notion of Using your own fucking left hand, then. <laughs> Ouch. Hey, sisters should be doing it for themselves. <laughs> Certainly. As soon as the flowers are watered, we will have coffee on the veranda, and you shall hear all about it. Yes, uh, watering, coffee, waiver, NDA, royalty agreement, blood pact, and then story time. You know, some legal details to work out. Yeah. <laughs> It's good. It's good to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, I was shortly sipping coffee with the little Lolita, my host's only daughter, and my pet beside me, while her mother rolled a cigarette, lighted it, and began as follows. That's not cool. uh, Your pet. That's, uh, (laughs) I'm going to call her Mr. Whiskerton. (laughs) (laughs) When we first came here years ago, it was a very different looking place. The wild bushland reached to the edge of the water and was such a dark wilderness <laughs> of thorns. <laughs> right, right to the edge. Shortly over that cleft over there. No. <laughs> Somewhere before the sinkhole. No, that's not an accurate map, Rob. <laughs> Those aren't the geographical features in the story. <laughs> and was such a dark wilderness of thorns, brambles, palms, wild fig trees, and other tropical vegetation that I did not dare venture in its depths. Oh, yeah, we're all worried about wild fig attacks, Rob. (laughs) You gotta watch out, man. You know, they don't talk about it very much, but in many parts of Africa, it's considered the most dangerous fruit. Yes, I I think we can say with 100% certainty that they don't talk about that much. (laughs) 
We need to start a campaign. Sure. But my husband and his workmen went manfully to work, felled trees, unrooted stumps, made hedges and ditches all day long, except in the severest part. Yes, all those rugged men getting sweatier as the day grew more severe, <laughs> taking off their shirts to keep from getting too severe. Well, I must say it got me quite severe and distressed under my uh, crotch cloth. Are these, are these synonyms coming across the language barrier? Oh, yes, sir. Uh... Crotch cloth, I often... It, it, it works in any language, huh? Yes, it's a normal colloquialism where I come yes. from. I often saw them come home so wearied that they would fall asleep where they stood and first think of food three or four hours later when they woke. Oh, yeah, well, we were going to offer food and shelter to the workers in the sweatshop conditions, uh, but they preferred to sleep on the floor. <laughs> And, you know, basically refused food. So what's a wealthy plantation owner to do, Rob? Hey, it's just doing what the people want. Oh, it seems clear they neither wanted uh, humane uh, sleeping conditions or nutritional supplements. And, and I'll say, the union leader himself, mm -hmm. right before he disappeared mysteriously and was never seen again, right. uh, told me that this is what the people wanted. Sleep, not food. I think the people have spoken. Yep. That NDA is still in effect, right? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. After a while, they got a portion of the ground under settlement, but had a throng of foes to combat. The worst were the ants, which, watched for on account of the depredations on plantations, have a way of making underground passages till they undermine the whole surface of a field, and it falls in like the crust of a king. Uh-huh. Okay. So when... You you just offered me coffee and ant cake. That was not that was not a cute nickname uh, for a cake. It was not like shoe fly pie. I, I don't know what you mean. I'm not sure I do either. Eat the cake. He eat some cake. You need your protein. Oh. Just north of us is a great gap in the ground, full of bushes and wild grass with here and there some rotten timber, where a whole settlement sank from the ants undermining the foundations. Of their relationships. <laughs> Genie's cheating on you, the ants would whisper in the dead of the night. Think of all the other ants you could be sleeping with. What? I mean people. People. Not ants, people. <laughs> wow. These are some weird dreams I'm having. <laughs> From this comes the saying we have in Paraguay, that our worst enemies are the Indian Braves and the Indian Ants. Uh, yeah, also the Indian maps of Paraguay that we rely on to tell us what part of India we're <laughs> in. Because they're just a little bit inaccurate. Just a, just a touch. It, just, it <laughs> seems like maybe the Indian naming was not... <laughs> I can't believe that stuck around. You know, they yeah. figured it out pretty quickly that this was not East India. Some people definitely did. <laughs> Luckily, the only Indians were friendly ones who exchanged all kinds of provisions, especially dried meats, for knives and brandy. And for broken promises, we traded a lot of those. <laughs> that, was, that was really the currency back then. <laughs> well, it's was quite easy to come by on our end. <laughs> we poisoned the ants, dug up their nests, flooded their passageways with boiling water, and so, in a great measure, were free from them, although they now sometimes come from the woods to attack the plantation. So, <laughs> to put it another way, <laughs> we are literally covered in them right now as we speak, but uh, we are ready to declare victory. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. But after them came another plague. Snakes. For a long time, I thought it was hopeless. My husband used to call them the tax collectors. And they did come just as regularly. And also, they're both slippery and unwelcome. And I think we could all agree that we've had it with these motherfucking tax collectors. On this motherfucking plantation. Nothing to add. 
No day passed without our finding one or more in the house. And once, oh heavens, what a fright I had. When Lolita was a baby, my husband and his men had gone off one morning to work, as usual, and the child was asleep on a mat at the end of the room. Oh, yeah, definitely. I did that uh, all the time. What? Yeah. Uh, right. you, oh, I'm sorry. You didn't mat your children, Rob? <laughs> oh. oh, no. It's uh, it's so much better for them than being in a crib and uh-huh. get that nurturing skin-to-ground contact that's so important <laughs> for baby. It's true. It's true. Baby needs skin-to-ground contact, Ron. <laughs> baby needs to know the floor is hard. Suddenly, I saw on the floor the skin of a mouse, from which the whole body had been sucked as from an orange. And I yelled, no, Lolita, no, no, my sucking, no. (laughs) Get it out of your mouth. No, the liver, spit it out. (laughs) Spit it out. Spit it into my hand. I knew at once that a snake must be near, for they feed on mice. And occasionally baby-sized rodents, but only if they haven't eaten lately, so... That's why I think it's safe to mat. (laughs) And eat them in this fashion. But, much as I looked around, I could see no snake. Till all at once it occurred to me, perhaps it was under the baby's mat. I snatched the child up and placed her in safety. On a second mat, I keep out on a railless balcony on the third (laughs) floor. And the view is gorgeous, totally unobstructed. (laughs) That's important. Child children are really reactive to stimuli, like views they need the blue sky horizons of the uh restricted future rob i mean (laughs) in the short time they have before getting (laughs) eaten by a snake that's right they gotta they just gotta keep rolling that's all the babies gotta do keep rolling right right. then i softly lifted a part of the mat and there it was the long slimy green and gold reptile coiled up and fast asleep Ah, how I jumped! I ran out in the court to call help. Luckily, our man Jose was there, and he killed it. Yes, luckily my man Jose was there and saved us with his severe muscles and... Uh, what? No, I'm I'm sure I said our man Jose. You know, like our house's man, the man of the house. No, that's not right, mate. Uh... Maybe we should go back to talking about how I let my baby sleep on top of a mat. (laughs) No. On top of a snake. It's more under the snake. (laughs) Under the snake. (laughs) But as we cleared more acres, the snakes left us to hide in the forest. I began to hope our cares were ended, but they had only just begun. Wild beasts now first appeared on the scene. The snakes aren't good. All right, whatever. Uh, the wild beasts are a local uh, grunge band. Um, <laughs> they were just appearing on the scene. That grunge. Oh, yeah. I saw that band. Yeah. I saw them open up uh, for uh, Rod Torfelson's Armada uh, featuring Herman Menderchuk. <laughs> yeah. It's a great show. <laughs> one morning, just as we were at breakfast, one of our herdsmen brought the news that our cattle which grazed in the tall grass on the other side of the river, had been attacked by a jaguar that had killed one of the bulls. The man who had told us just barely escaped with his life, yet he would scarcely have done so if he had not misled the beast, or had there not been a fat ox there. Misled the beast. (laughs) Mm, Okay, so when I said, hey, I'm a jaguar and I'm going to eat you, and you said, oh, that's cool, but I know lots of people you can eat, and they're right over here. It, you just, you meant this ox. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty fat, but still, <laughs> I feel you've been less than honest with me. So when you said that I would only have to give you $500, and uh-huh. then everyone that I then brought into this business would give me five hundred dollars oh it's a multi-level marketing scheme and yeah i'm i'm letting you in at the top (laughs) there's um there's a lot of jaguar tunity in in this enterprise (laughs) jaguar tunity uh jaguar tunity was uh was the first opener and uh the crowd was (laughs) 
was really upset. They only got to play one song, and yeah. then they got booed off. <laughs> Still, hell of a show. Hell of a show. Sure, well, it was entertaining. You gotta give it that. A week passed without a new alarm, and we'd come to think less about it, when suddenly three or four Indians rushed to tell us how a great jaguar had broken into their camp and killed a woman and one of their dogs. When my husband heard the story, he concluded that it was the same animal that had attacked our bull, for the Indians described it as a creature of singular color, far lighter than any they had seen about there. So they named it the White Death. And nicknamed it Gerard Butler at the box office. <laughs> Why do they keep making them then, Alan? Come on. <laughs> okay. I couldn't tell you, Rob. Oh, I can't wait for his next movie, Jaguar Has Fallen. You know what? Um, I think they've decided to gender swap it back. You know, it's, it's Butler at Sea. <laughs> and then his movie next month will be even better. And then the one the next month. If these trajectories are anything to go by, we are holding it upside down. <laughs> We all thought it was now time to do something, and my husband called his people together to go out and hunt it. Yeah, his, his people. <laughs> okay, folks, we're having a mandatory off-site work function oh. this Friday. It's a team-building exercise with a uh, problem-solving component. Uh -huh. Lots of fresh air oh. exercise. Oh. Um, some light drinking of... Blood, possibly. Well, let's say licking of blood, depending on how thirsty he is. <laughs> Do we get paid for this? Of course, no. <laughs> so it's a team building exercise. Is there a reason why you're standing in front of a large box that says Jaguar Trap on it? Uh, yeah, that's the prize. <laughs> Ooh. It's for the team that does the best. They get to take it home afterwards. Oh, yeah. I could use a new Jaguar and travel. Yeah. Bad, yeah. I remember that morning distinctly. They went away cheerfully enough, each man with his gun and hunting life, and Morrow, the bloodhound, was with them. My husband turned round just as he entered the wood and kissed his hand to me. Then they vanished in the forest. And that was the last time I ever saw my love, H Jose. <laughs> Ouch. Wait, uh, wait, sorry, no. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. Can we cross that out of the story that you're writing and replace it with, uh, remember, yes, the baby thing again? <laughs> good, good. When I found myself with Lolita in the house and thought of what might happen if they met that terrible wild animal, such anxiety seized me, although I never thought I could be in danger that I could not be contented till I had locked every door in the house. You locked the door, but mm -hmm. did you put the chain lock on is the question, because any security expert will tell you that a German Jaguarler will <laughs> open up one of those cheap Home Depot locks in a second flat. It's not, a, it's not even an impediment to them. Jaguarler? Yeah, any determined Jaguarler. Um, but you wouldn't just go with Cat Burglar? No, they uh, they thought that was too long a name uh, for them. They decided to... The Jaguars. Just... They decided. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, good. they said, cat burglar. Let's just simplify it. Jaguarler. Well, it's also more specific. And they want yeah. that credit. Sure. We don't want Pumas involved. <laughs> no, no. Hey, once the Pumas start getting involved, then it's all over. <laughs> and then I seated myself in the great sitting room took Lolita upon my lap, and tried to tell her a story. And, and, I took up all the mats in the house just to make sure there was no place for the jaguar to hide under. <laughs> I was very careful to do that. <laughs> oh, the rugs? No, they can't have jaguars. Well, no, it's just the mats. They're just the mats. I didn't, there were so many rugs, I didn't even want to think. <laughs> Suddenly, I heard a scratch along the roof, and then a dull thud, as if something heavy had fallen. Like Olympus, or Angel, <laughs> or Gerard Butler's asking rape. 
anxious and nervous as I was, I started up with a cry, although I had no presentiment what it was. The next moment I heard just over me a sound which I could not mistake, a long, passionate roar that I had often heard from the woods at night. And from Jose's servants' quarters. <laughs> just as I was walking by them, that's all. Yeah, oh, yes, I, from from outside is what I'm saying. Never, never from the inside. Never. <clears throat> I, uh, I, uh, maybe you could go into some more detail on how, how much the snake bit my baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's an that's a important detail your readers might prefer to these salacious details you seem to be <laughs> jotting down in your notebook. And never without feeling as if my heart stood still. The thought rushed through my mind. Oh, heaven, the jaguar! Oh, she's a rich lady, so that's not too unusual. Oh, the jaguar? Well, how will I ever get to Pilates now? <laughs> Guess I'll have to take the Aston Martin. I don't have any cute puns about that. <laughs> I shall never forget that moment. One minute I was rigid and helpless, as if life had departed. And then a thought flashed upon me. The jaguar was not to be kept off the lower floor, because there were no doors, only curtains. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking what? They've got a kid here. <laughs> you locked all the doors except <laughs> the non-existent ones yeah. on the ground floor. I don't know what's happening. I mean, come on. <laughs> the stairs are there. Who heard of a jaguar that can climb stairs? Come to think of it, this might also be related to the ant and snake problems. <laughs> Could they possibly have something to do with it? Nah, it's a coincidence. Oh. There was a large empty chest in the room, and I seized my child and entered it, shutting down the lid and holding it from the inside. Then huddling under various dry-aged meats to throw off our scent. <laughs> so we couldn't track us. It's a cunning plan. We got one of those meat boxes. <laughs> meat box! It was, the, it was, of course, the the large chest where I store all my Hello Fresh meals. Yes. It was not a moment too soon. We were scarcely hidden when I heard the great paws scratching along the floor and the hungry sniffing of the jaguar, showed me that he was in search of food. He came straight to the chest and paused a moment, as if he feared a trap. Uh, mm, nah, no, nah, I've been fooled by the old box filled with a soft, fleshy woman and her succulent baby free sample trick before. <laughs> no, nah, next thing I'm driving home from the Panther Costco with an entire pallet of frozen human balls. <laughs> and they just get freezer burned. I end up throwing them out anyways. You know, I've taken to scooping my own human balls. Oh, have you? It saves me so much time and money, and it's way fresher. I bet it tastes great. <laughs> it's it's okay. It's a, it's a little stringy, to be honest. <laughs> then he put his head close to a small opening so that I could feel his hot breath. He sniffed a little and then tried to raise the lid with a paw. Oh, that's cute. Does he do any other tricks? I taught my pet raptor to open doorknobs, and it took a lot of snacks to train him. But I finally got around those pesky California landlord laws. <laughs> it's ridiculous. How come you can have a raptor and you can't have a ferret, Alan? No, I don't know. It's, it's, it's stupid. How I trembled. But the great paw would not go in the narrow crevice, and I held the cover fast, by clinging to the inner part of the lock with all my strength of desperation. All right, hold on. Let me just try to get a claw in there. <laughs> ah, damn these tamper-proof human containers. <laughs> all he could do was stretch out his tongue and lick my fingers till they bled, as if they had been scratched by a saw. Yes, I understand, ma'am. It's obvious to me you're not enjoying our spa's living natural package. If you didn't like the fish pedicure, and you don't like the jaguar manicure, then I'm pretty sure you're gonna hate the gecko wax. Oh, no. 
I just can't believe they trained the geckos to do that. It's pretty impressive. The geckos love doing it. It's what they were made <laughs> for, Rob. And then, as he tasted blood and heard Lolita cry, for my poor darling was just as frightened as I was, his eagerness increased, and he began to make piercing yells, which sent icy chills over me. Still, the worst was yet to come. He started licking my armpits and it just squirm city. This is so ticklish. When the jaguar found that he could not reach me from below, he sprang upon the chest. His huge weight crushed my two fingers between the two parts of the lock. Then I thought all was over and shrieked so that it rang through the whole house. Hunger cats. Hunger cats. Hunger cats. Oh, shit. That hurts. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Wait, what is, what is, uh, what's his face say? A scarf? Scarf? No, snarf. Scarf? Scarf? Snarf. 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 Okay. Uh, hold on. I was, that uh, is what he says. I know. I got caught up in that. I was, <laughs> forgot what he was supposed to say. Holy fucking shit, Panthro. <laughs> oh, the... oh, shit. I just took a dump, Lionel. <laughs> snarf, snarf, I slept with your wife. <laughs> I have no idea what, what they were actually saying, but that's my memory. That should be it. <laughs> There's something about poop, sure. But my cries were answered by a sound that made my heart throb with joy, answered by the barking of our bloodhound. The jaguar heard it too, for he sprang down, and stood for a moment listening, and then ran to the door as if to flee. Or to reenact in a way that totally misses the underlying subject matter, the movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. <laughs> I'll, I'll text. No subtext with that dog. <laughs> <laughs> Just so on the nose. <laughs> exactly. Again came the sound of the dog's bark, this time nearer, and at the same time the voices of men calling to each other. Contrary to expectation, they were already coming back. Dudes, get out of the house and don't come back without a dead jaguar. This is just like when I tell my kids, go find their iPad and two minutes later, come back and say, well, we can't find it. And I'm like, I'm trapped in a box and your iPad is trying to eat me. So I guess you didn't <laughs> look very hard, did you? <laughs> look with your eyes next time. <laughs> Giant eye crushing my box <laughs> that's that's a different Just story crush it. that's a story for another day rob <laughs> meanwhile the jaguar seemed to be bewildered let me say that again <laughs> be bewildered <laughs> uh, and uh. ran wildly to and fro suddenly a loud cry came from one of the windows and then two shots and a fearful howl then my husband's voice anxiously called, Cochita, where are you? I could just get out of the chest, drag myself to the door, and let my husband in. Then I swooned away. Wait, okay, wait a minute. What door? <laughs> the, the one, wait, the curtain door? I thought you just said they don't have doors. Yeah. Where did the jaguar come in from then? I don't know. A window, but that would not be very smart no, to the... <laughs> keep a window open, right? This is, I, did we just get, like, Chris Angel mind fucked here? Is the <laughs> camera going to pan back to a coffee cup with a picture of a jaguar on it? Oh, a... wait a minute. The snakes were the jaguar all along. Okay, I don't get that. I don't get it. I don't like these Chris Nolan movies either. <laughs> they told me afterward that our bloodhound found the jaguar's trail, leading straight back to our house. And they all hurried home like mad. My husband and Jose came ahead and shot the jaguar. Mm, let's be honest. I think we know which real man actually mm. shot the jaguar. Her husband, yes. That's, but That's what I'd prefer you to write in the story, yes. <laughs> I could not move a joint of that hand for many weeks afterward. The Indians gave me medicine to heal it. And they say that after a while... I can use it again. Yeah, after a while. The doctors don't even 
want to commit to a diagnosis and jokes these days. <laughs> Doctor, it hurts when I do this. Then don't do that for a while. We'll just schedule some unnecessary blood work to get done and schedule a follow-up and see whether you don't do that prognosis changes in a while. Sorry, I just changed insurance providers, Rob. <laughs> I'm not really in a charitable mood. <laughs> Everything's going great. Yeah. It's a whole new year of deductibles <laughs> and out of pockets. I did not need this injury to make me remember the day. If I were to live a thousand years, I could not forget the terrible moments I spent in that chest. Chris Jenner's boyfriend, Corey Gamble, finally admitted on his deathbed. <laughs> the end. Well, there we go. A thrilling tale of chests and bushes. That's a good summary. <laughs> Jack wires, I guess. You've hit most of the the subjects that are involved in there. Missed a lot of the animals. <laughs> Some of the people. Yeah, aunts, uncles, uh, Jose. A lot yep. going on. A lot of family, yeah. Well, it was a, a thrilling story to be sure, but Alan... Is there any kind of lesson or moral that we could learn from this little nugget? Oh, yeah. There's definitely a moral, Rob. Mm -hmm. The moral is when you think of the movie 300, uh, the title is not a recommendation for the number of movies you should put Gerard Butler in. <laughs> what is with you and Jerry Butler? Oh, Jerry. Yeah. I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, do you and I um, need to uh, move over so we could get you and yeah. uh, Jerry in the limelight? You going to start your own podcast now? Oh, no, we're not starting a podcast. All right, we've talked about doing a few specials here and there. But, uh, you know, any rumors that Gerard Butler, my good friend Jerry, and I are starting a new podcast, are just, they're just that, Alan. I mean, how could I get a major motion picture star who's in amazing films, you know, month after month, week after week, some months, to, to really podcast with me, I, <laughs> it's laughable. Yeah, it is laughable. Well, I mean, not if you're including the bounty hunter, and then it's very much not laughable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think that's going to about wrap it up for this week's episode, Alan. Uh, I hope everybody who's listening now will tune in next time for another exciting Interrupted. So when you said there was a chest full of meat here, okay, and I come in. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, but you didn't leave me the key to the lock on the chest. So I just feel like maybe you're being somewhat duplicitous. You know, say somewhat south of honest is, is, is all I'm saying. I don't want to put too fine a point upon it. But, uh, hey, you got some of that rank grass over here. Tail! Hey, Lindsay, are you ever curious about those old books with weird covers in the bargain bins? Oh my god, yes. Hey, Daniel, would you be in a book club where no one reads the whole book? Funny you ask, because that's our show, 33% Pulp. You, I, and a guest host each read a different third of a pulp novel and then recap the whole thing together. We start with context, the author, genre, themes, and so on. By the end of the third episode, you'll have heard the main plot, our commentary, and confusion. And sometimes we have companion episodes with related content from beyond the book with other podcasts. We're 33% Pulp and 100% Hopeful you'll join us. Bye! Bye.